Welcome to another exciting episode of The Trading Bell. This week on the show, we shall be speaking to Raj Shah. He is a derivatives specialist as we take stock of where we are as a country when it comes to the derivatives market and also demystifying how is this market performing and what are the opportunities that lie ahead. Well, before we get into that interview, let's take a look at Raj's profile. Raj Shah is a CEO and Portfolio Manager at Meridian Partners LLP since 2017. He has extensive trading experience in New York, London and Nairobi. He's also an expert in global market interest rates, equities and FX including swaps, futures and options. He's a member of Bond Market Association in Kenya Executive Committee and the Nairobi Securities Exchange Derivatives Advisory Committee. All right, uh, Sha, thank you for joining us on the show and uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year and thank you so much for having me on the show. All right. And uh, for the beginner's purposes, uh, many Kenyans do love to hear products that can make them make some money. And uh, one of the products that uh, has been touted as the next big thing is the derivatives market. Perhaps let's begin by just uh, demystifying. What are derivatives? Yeah, sure. So uh, firstly, to kind of define what a derivative is, a uh, derivative is a financial product that derives its value from an underlying asset. So the underlying asset could be a commodity, currency, bond, or stocks. Uh, in this particular case, the NSC has launched futures. Futures are essentially agreements or contracts between two parties whereby one party agrees to buy a particular asset at a pre-specified price and quantity on a particular date in the future. The underlying assets in this case are stocks that the NSC has on its main exchange um, and they only also have uh, another underlying asset which is the NSC index itself. All right, so just help me understand this Raj, uh, if I'm buying a derivatives, what is required of me? Sure, so I mean the first thing is uh, futures contracts are actually the simplest derivatives um, and so that means that the requirements for you purchasing futures contracts are going to be way simpler than they would be for other derivatives. But to kind of explain the, the way that an investor would go about um, investing in futures in, on the NSC, um, futures are traded on the NSC by trading members. So an investor would need to open an account with a trading member. Um, and they would also need to fill in some other relevant documentation, such as a risk disclosure form. Uh, once the account is opened, an investor would need to deposit collateral in the form of cash with the trading member. And the trading member will use that um, to post initial margin and variation margin on behalf of the investor. Um, and then from that point, he's all set to trade. All right. And uh, this uh, whole aspect around derivatives, um, once I get in, is there a, a limit I can put my money, is there a maximum amount? How does it normally work? There's, um, there's similar rules as there are for, uh, for, for stocks in terms of um, how investors are treated. So for example, an investor would not be allowed to own um, a very, very large portion of the outstanding futures contracts um, if that deemed that he would have uh, undue control over, the, over that company's shares. Um, other than that, there's no sort of restrictions in terms of how much an investor can invest. Uh, and because futures are traded on the exchange, an investor can you know, invest one day and if he feels that the, the trade is, uh, has kind of worked out to its completion, they can exit the, the contract by either selling those same shares, uh, or same contracts, same futures contracts, or by selling a different futures contracts to mitigate the risk of the original trade. All right. And um, a basic question, uh, Raj, have people made money out of this? Yes, absolutely. Um, <coughs> so from the, from, from the first day when the NSC actually started its pilot uh, trading program, where trading members were trading capital for their own accounts, um, we've been seeing uh, sort of results that the NSC has shared with us. Um, and by and large, most investors have been able to make money uh, by trading futures. Um, one important distinction between futures and stocks is that it is much easier to trade futures in both directions. So it's not necessarily a zero-sum game all the time because an investor could have uh, a long position in stocks um, and he might use futures to hedge, that, um, hedge his stocks portfolio. 
Um, so that necessi necessarily doesn't mean he loses money as stocks go up because he's only hedging his stocks portfolio. Um, so in, in short, an investor can certainly make money by trading futures. All right. And uh, <clears throat> let's talk about now the future outlook for futures because um, when you look at uh, our stock markets, uh, they're not that dependent when you compare with other uh, exchanges across uh, the world. And uh, does the product have potential for further growth? Yes, in fact, I think that um, one way of actually saying this is that the outlook for futures is very, very strong and futures will be the future of the market in Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, I think you touched on an important point that um, the depth of, uh, of markets in Kenya is smaller compared to other, other markets out there. Um, futures is something that can actually help with this because investors can trade both long and short. Um, this will drive more volume because um, you know, they can hedge their, their portfolios um, and they can also uh, speculate on both price rises and price declines. So at some point, um, and as the market progresses, we expect that the value and volume of futures trading will eclipse the value and volume of trading on the spot equities market. So I think that you know, we, can, we can think of futures as the platform that the NSC can use um, to grow um, financial markets in Kenya further. All right. And this brings me to my next question. Why are derivatives important to retail and institutional investors? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, firstly, the capital requirements of trading futures are, are much smaller than they are for trading stocks. Um, this is important for both retail and institutional investors. Um, so the way it works is that um, if you would like to purchase a futures contract, you need to post a percentage of the total trade exposure. That's called the initial margin. So usually the initial margin is something like 10%. Um, in certain cases, it's lower or higher depending on the risk profile of that particular security. Yeah. But the point is that it's a smaller amount than the total exposure that you would have to uh, post if you, if you bought the a stock directly from the market. Um, in a country like Kenya, that's actually important because interest rates are relatively high in Kenya. Um, the excess cash that is saved by only posting the initial margin versus posting the full proceeds of a stock trade mm -hmm. means that an investor can earn significant income from the excess cash. Uh, the second thing is something we've touched on already. Um, that's that an investor can trade both long and short. Yeah. This is really important for both retail and institutional investors. Um, an institutional investor may have a large portfolio of stocks and um, he can hedge this uh, through futures by either selling the NSC 25 index future or by selling single stocks futures. Concurrently, retail investors um, can trade, can, can speculate on price rises on, in the market by only having to post a fraction of the total trade exposure. So um, it's very important actually that institutional investors especially um, start trading futures now so that they are ready for the market evolution. All right. And uh, as we bring this conversation to a close, uh, <coughs> any investor always weighs their risk. And uh, of course, the markets are very interconnected with whatever is happening in East Africa, whatever is happening across uh, Europe or be it in uh, the Gulf countries has a direct effect back home. And uh, how vulnerable are derivatives uh, susceptible to internal and external risks. Uh, what should uh, investors look out for when they see perhaps some certain market uh, uh, indications that might have an impact on the investment? What do they really need to look out for? Yeah, I mean, that's an important question. And I think um, the way I would answer that is break it down into two parts. Uh, what an investor cares about is are, are two things. Um, the first one is liquidity, um, and the second is the outlook for that security. Um, I think that both of these uh, qualities are equally important. So in terms of the value of the security going up and going down, as you mentioned, that's going to be dependent on a lo lot of global factors. Yeah. Um, I think at the moment, the, the, market, um, the global markets are generally in a, in a risk-on uh, mood. Um, uh, the, the sort of integration of Joe Biden and the control of both houses of Congress in, in the U.S. by the Democratic Party um, has, has ushered in uh, risk on sentiment because 
there's an expectation of uh, additional fiscal stimulus. This is f fed through to emerging markets, um, and to, in particular emerging markets in, in Asia, um, but it's also fed through to uh, frontier markets like Kenya. So I think at the moment the outlook is relatively positive. Uh, in terms of liquidity, I think that this is a very, very important aspect, especially for investors who look to trade actively in this market. Um, and one thing that futures allows you to do, it allows you to enter and exit trades relatively easily. And the, also the cost of entering and exit, exiting trades is, is not as high as it is for the spot market. Mm -hmm. This is because the exchange fees and the brokerage fees are lower for futures than they are for the spot equities market. So um, as, as the market progresses, we expect that liquidity will sort of move towards the futures market because of the lower costs associated with trading. Um, and I think that will be an important aspect for investors as they consider new investments. In All right. Kenya. And uh, your parting shot, uh, we are going into a, an interesting uh, season as a country. We have an upcoming election. Uh, there's chances that we might have a referendum down the line. And all this uh, political noise could, in one way or the other, affect uh, the stability of the economy and how the currencies perform. Um, do, you, do you see any uh, risks in this, how we manage it as, a, as an economy? Uh, or is it a market that is very mature that uh, investors have taken long positions? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, political events in countries like Kenya are always um, events that investors are wary of um, because it's hard to predict exactly what is going to happen from these events. Um, historically, there's been um, a period of time where investors sort of don't like to take a lot of risks leading into um, these sort of events. Um, but what we've seen historically is that um, when this happens and prices decline slightly, they turn out to be very, very good opportunities for long-term buyers to enter the market. Mm -hmm. So what we expect is that if foreign investors, for example, take a back seat in the next 18 months or so, um, we expect that local funds um, who have been increasing their equities allocation slowly uh, will probably step in and take, take on the role of, uh, of supporting asset prices. All right. Quite some interesting insights there. Raj, uh, derivatives specialist, just giving us a sense of what this product is all about and the amazing future it has when it comes to alternative investments for investors. Well, that's where we take a quick break to usher in a market analysis as we take a look at how the money markets have been performing through the week. There goes the bell. That means the markets have come to a close right here at the bells. And joining us to help us with the numbers is Linda Kiraide, who is a research analyst at AIB Access Africa. Many thanks for joining us here, Linda. Thank you for having me on the show today. Excellent. Now, you know, I, I must indeed start by asking a general question. What has been your observation as an analyst through this year? Yes, January to Feb. Uh, but of course, having a uh, a look back at the year how 2020 was quite a hit and president as, as and president as many has said uh, so what would you would be your comment from the start of the year how has this been i'd say 2021 has been uh, so far a good year okay we have seen uh, continued uh, recovery in terms of the general economy mm -hmm. in the global markets and even locally and uh, this is anticipated to hold actually for the rest of the year mm -hmm. uh, with the onset of uh, the vaccination yeah. uh, with the discovery of the covid vaccine yeah. we expect that uh, investor sentiments are expected to continue to improve uh, as we go on, uh, yeah. we expect to see continued uh, uh, reopenings of, of economies. Yeah. Uh, of course, there are jitters around uh, new strains of the virus, uh -huh. but uh, we, we all hope and believe that uh, things will continue to improve just as we have seen for the past one month. 
you're very right, especially when it comes to matters the vaccine, because we've seen how it has excited people that, you know, there's mm. at least hope at the end of it all. Mm. Speaking of which, by the way, Kenya, I think in the next few weeks, we're also expecting to have some jabs, is it? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So that means uh, locally as well, we'll be uh, at least having some hopes, especially in the markets. Uh, let me just jump in right now to matters international investors as well. What has been your observations? Is there some heightened activity now that there's all this hope that we see? Mm -hmm. The global markets have also have been on a, on a good uh, path to recovery. Okay. Uh, we have seen continued interest in tech stocks, mm -hmm. which last year we saw are what most of the investors uh, looked into. Yeah. And uh, quite interesting has been the, the uptick by uh, inactivity by retail investors oh. uh, on the Reddit pl platforms. You have seen what happens with GameStop. And uh -huh. the hope is that uh, retail investors will continue to have interest in the markets so that uh, the markets continue to come up. That's interesting too. Uh, it's an interesting observation that uh, a lot of retailers are also coming in. Yeah, yeah, And sure. we surely hope to also encourage them to listen. Keep yes. on, keep on coming on. <laughs> we also hope it comes into the local market also. Yeah, Yes. absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I just recently have been following some of the headlines in our, some of, of our business outlets and there's a lot of conversation about the oil prices and what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so my question would be, is there something as well that you are observing from your end when it comes to matters oil? Mm -hmm. And of course, I wouldn't want you to miss out on also talking about the dollar, because of course, the oil and the dollar somehow dictate a lot of things when it comes to matters economy. Mm -hmm. What has been your observation so far? So uh, we have seen oil prices come up, mm -hmm. uh, driven by expectation of demand. Mm -hmm. As the economies open up, you expect to see a lot of activity in manufacturing, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, tourism, in uh, transport industries. Yeah. Something that has not been happening in the year 2020. Mm -hmm. We saw most of the economies remain closed for most of the year. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the demand that is expected to come up is what is expected to continue to drive up the oil prices. Yeah. This is also going to be pushed also by suppliers holding on to uh, the barrels that they already have oh. in anticipation that as the demand comes up they'll be able to sell it at better prices. Mm -hmm. So oil prices will continue to go up definitely okay. and unfortunately given that we are a huge importer of oil this mm -hmm. is continue this will expected to, con to continue to affect our shilling okay. which has not been performing so well. Mm -hmm. uh, so the dollar is expected to, to be quite expensive for yeah. us mm -hmm. and uh, looking also into the fact that we expect to see a bit of inflation from the fact that there's an anina expense to come so drought higher food prices and actually the expectation is that we might we might see lower double digits on the inflation yeah. going into a uh, half year and okay. the middle of the year from May onwards okay which is quite detrimental to us definitely looks like it's tough times ahead is it <laughs> <laughs> in terms of uh, the currency, yes. Yeah. Uh, CBK has been quite supportive in terms of uh, trying to manage the currency versus the dollar. Yeah. Uh, not really so much activity versus other international currencies, okay. but most specifically on the dollar because our imports are mostly dollar denominated mm -hmm. and the fact that most of our debt also is, is dollar denominated. Okay. Yeah. I think that's, those are very interesting sentiments there, uh, Linda. Let's get into the markets now here and we look at the indices. Mm -hmm. There's a, a little bit of a positive because all along when I look at the all share index, when I look at the 20 share index, when I look at the 25 share index, all of them are on a rise. It's mm -hmm. on a positive. We don't have a negative like we have had it's the previous weeks before. Mm -hmm. what, what is your observation on this? Is it as a result as well of the same thing that we are talking about, activity in the market? Yes, yes. We, uh -huh. we expect to, to, to see more investors coming into the market. Mm -hmm. Investor confidence is continuing to build up uh, on an expectation of a general economy recovery yeah. so we, we we expect to see these indices continue to come up uh, as we go into more into the year Great. and of course this will, this has been if you look at like for the nsc20 if you look at how safaricom has performed so far yeah. uh, which has really pushed uh, mm -hmm. the indices up if you look at uh, the banks which have been slightly up also this year mm -hmm. so for this we expect that the market will continue to come up as, as activity increases. All right, thanks for that. Um, let's talk about some of our top gainers. Then you can see amongst the top five, we have banks. You can see Stanbic Bank Holdings being, I mean, taking the lead. Then we have BK Group. We also have KCB and Apps amongst the top gainers. What's happening to the banks? Looks like there's some good news. Uh, 
Next month, in March, banks are expected to release their FY20 earnings. Yeah. So, of course, there's some anticipation of some profit taking through dividends by investors. Mm -hmm. However, I would not say that uh, it's, it's really 100% positive, just okay. a speculative move because we have seen some of these banks also issue profit warnings. Okay. So, uh, I think the fact that investors expect that some of these banks will pay dividend, mm -hmm. which, uh, if you remember, CBK had said that they are the ones to approve the dividend payment, depending on the capital position of these banks. Okay. So just some speculative profit-taking actions by investors. Amongst the top gainers is EABL. What's your comment on this? I know uh, there's been a, a little bit of a setback way back because of the lockdowns, but mm -hmm. I think we are seeing some ease of them so far. Mm -hmm. What's your comment on this is because of this that we see? Uh, if you look at the EABL's uh, first half uh, 21 earnings, you'll see there has been a uh, uh, significant improvement half on half mm -hmm. that is in comparison to the year between January to June mm -hmm. 2020 mm -hmm. and uh, uh June to December 2020. Mm -hmm. So there's some, there, ha, there has been significant improvement in terms of the numbers. Okay. And I think this is what has improved uh, the investor sentiment and the confidence that they have in, in breweries. Okay. And uh, this is a counter that I would say ha, ha, is always affected by the economy. So <laughs> when things are good, EABL, EABL will always shine. Uh, yeah. When things are bad, EABL will be among the counters that suffer the most. It's also a counter that is affected by the tax man a lot. Yes, right? yes, sure. <laughs> oh my. Uh, let's get to the losers now. Um, you know, I see quite some interesting uh, names here. I can see the Nation Media Group. I can also see housing finance as well, amongst others. I don't know, maybe you could start by talking about matters housing. Because interesting enough, I see housing finance here, yet there was some very interesting news that we saw, mm -hmm. some merger. Uh, I think it was with Britain. Yeah. Uh, what, what, what is happening now? Uh, for HF, they had capital issues, uh -huh. so they had issues with the regulator, their capital position was uh, not significant and they needed some buffers. Yeah. So that's when Britam came in and gave them uh, a billion mm -hmm. uh, to boost their capital position. Okay. However, uh, I feel that uh, despite them saying that they will be using part of this money to uh, move from real estate uh, to SME and retail banking, yeah, yeah. I feel that they, the fact that the economy is not really so friendly, mm -hmm. uh, the economy is still sl on a slowdown, yeah. and uh, recovery may take t some time is why investors do not feel so confident okay. about HF despite the fact that they got the capital that they wanted. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. I think I want to end by, I can see one of the top losers is Nation Media Group. Your comment on that? Uh, this is just, a, I would say, that just a factor of demand and supply. Okay. Uh, for the longest time, Nation Media has not been doing so well in terms of their financials, uh, in terms of uh, management strategy, and that is what, uh, that is why investors have been feeling not so confident in taking up the stock. So okay. these are just forces of demand and supply. All right. No, no new news. No new news. All right. <laughs> yeah. Linda Kiraida there, research analyst, AIB Access Africa. She's not yet done because right after this, we're getting to Markets 101. All right, on Markets 101 today we get to learn the difference between M1 and M2. Those are terms that are used in the markets and Linda is going to tell us where do we even use them. You know, Linda, over to you. What is the difference between those two terms? So M1 and M2 are terms used to describe the money supply. Mm -hmm. That is the amount of liquidity and uh, money that is in circulation in an economy. Yeah. So M1 is, I would say, the most liquid. That is the money we have in terms of coins currencies, uh, demand deposits, that is the m demand deposits are money that you can just walk into a bank, uh, request for your deposit and you get uh, your deposit. Mm -hmm. So M1 is basically, I would say, what the, man the amount of money we use on a day-to-day -day basis for our daily purchases, for expenses, for uh, short-term investments. Okay. That is what you refer to M1. All right. So M2 mm -hmm. is M1 plus uh, uh, what I would say long-term deposits. Mm -hmm. That is money that you cannot access uh, as in an instant, mm -hmm. money that you would take time. So money held in fixed deposits, in long-term deposits, mm -hmm. is what now you would call, uh, plus now the M1 is what you would call M2. All right, <laughs> quite some terms there. And I hope you've learned something about M1, M2, if anyone mentions them out there. Now you're a little wiser than you were before now. Uh, time now for my favorite part, which is the questions that you've sent to us. 
All right, first of all, to thank you all for the questions that you send and to also encourage you to keep sending them. And so our question today is uh, provide a definition of what a working capital is. Provide a definition of what a working capital is. Over to you, Linda, for that question. Uh, so working capital, uh, from the word working capital, there is working. That is uh, a continuous activity. Yeah. So working capital uh, is the current assets minus the current liabilities. So in a business... Current assets minus the cur current liabilities. liabilities okay. So the current assets are uh, assets that uh, you can access easily. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, in terms of inventory, cash, mm -hmm. uh, current liabilities uh, are also short-term, I would say short-term debts. Okay. So short-term loans, uh, maybe an overdraft, uh, uh, basically that. So okay. current assets minus current liabilities is what gives you the working capital of the business. It's actually a loaded question. I thought it was actually very simple, but uh, it has some mathematics to it. Thanks so much for that question. It keeps sending them on. So we're about to close the session, but we get to our historical fact of the week. All right, that's it from us right here on the Trading Bell Show. Hoping that you learned a lot of things, especially on our first part of the interview on Manta's derivatives. Always get to know that learning is never an ending uh, journey. And so you can always keep learning one or two, three things here, right here on the market. And here on the Trading Bell Show, we'll keep you informed as well on the latest news that comes that come along with uh, what is happening in the markets industry. Thank you so much, Linda, for coming. Uh, most welcome. Great. So from us right here is to ask you to keep in touch with us, of course, on the social media handles appearing at the bottom end of your screen. We always want to hear from you and love it when you speak to us. That's it from here. See you next week, same time. Bye-bye.